Story continued from Hell Creek Playlist. It is early morning over the Lake Cretaceous floodplains, where a group of herbivorous dinosaurs is stirring from sleep. Rising with the sun is a herd of Edmontosaurus, generalist herbivores that belong to one of the most successful families of the Cretaceous, the Hadrosaurs. This herd is made up of all different ages and sizes, from immense adults to tiny individuals that have only recently left the nest. Edmontosaurus gather in nesting grounds to lay their eggs and raise their young for a few weeks until they are large enough to move with the herd. At this time of year, the youngest members are about a meter long and will grow fast in the next three years as the group moves through the forests and open plains, always looking for more food. Though like most of their relatives, Edmontosaurus can feed on most plant matter, even rotten wood. But they prefer lowlands with varied vegetation from ferns and cycads to those that grow in waterways. That is their destination, and as each member of the herd rises and stretches from their slumber, they slowly make their way to a nearby river. The progress has been slow, as the larger herd members have to move at a pace that the youngsters can keep up, not to mention the simple task on the adults' part of not stepping on any smaller than themselves. Eventually, the herd makes its way to the river and begins to fan out, some go for the plants growing alongside the water, rising up onto their hind legs to snap or strip plants with their wide beaks. Others wade into the water and plunge their heads below the surface to dredge up the waterlogged meals. As they forage, the adults will sometimes break off branches, which fall to the ground, allowing the younger members to feed as well. Some will even pull up masses of reeds and other aquatic plant life to dump it on the shore for their young. What is a mouthful for an adult could fill the stomachs of multiple yearlings. All the while, each of them will regularly check their surroundings, as there are many predators that could prey on the herd's youngest additions. But no matter how large they get, for Edmontosaurus there will always be one animal that they fear, and that is an adult Tyrannosaurus rex, the most powerful carnivore on the planet. They are right to fear as one of them is watching them from between the trees. Biding his time, this male is on the hunt, but not just for himself. At this time of year, mated pairs of rexes have made their nests and are taking turns guarding it while the other finds food. Edmontosaurus are a primary source of prey for them, as they are not as fast as other dinosaurs like Struthiomimus, and not as well armed as Triceratops and Ankylosaurus that does not mean they are easy prey, not by a long shot. Because Edmontosaurus are huge, 13 meters long, almost 4 meters tall, even when standing quadrupedally, with some weighing over 7 tons. Not to mention that they live in large herds, while he hunts alone. It would be foolish of any Tyrannosaurus to underestimate the sheer bulk of even a grown female let alone the considerably larger males. Though he weighs over 9 tons, the difference in mass doesn't assure victory when up close and personal. He knows this all too well. His body is covered in scars from various hunts, but his left hand is missing one finger, which he lost when an Edmontosaurus bit it off during a struggle. Normally, he would go after the young and the injured, but he has to feed both himself and his mate. Today, he wants to target a larger individual, a sub-adult should do in that regard. He has been patrolling this area knowing it is frequented by the large herbivores. Now he just has to get close enough in order to strike. Edmontosaurus are much faster than Tyrannosaurus in a sprint, so he cannot afford a prolonged chase. This has to be done quickly. After remaining still for almost half an hour, slow progression of the herd is steadily moving them closer to his position. One adult female with a group of juveniles of various ages approaches his position. Just a little closer. But then she stops and begins sniffing the air. She clearly knew something dangerous was close by. Knowing this was his best shot, the male Tyrannosaurus broke cover, 
marching towards his prey, parting all the foliage in his path. The Edmontosaurus saw the monstrous head of the predator moving for them, and turned around, rising onto their back legs and letting out trumpet-like alarm calls. Lorex drew in behind one of the young herbivores and bit downwards, but his jaws snapped shut, just missing his target. The whole herd was moving now. All were running along the bank of the river in a single direction. The female and her group formed in with the huge carnival right on their tail. Soon, he was running alongside the herd, forcing some to run into the river, sending water splashing everywhere. The Tyrannosaurus couldn't keep up, so instead he turned his head sideways and tried to bite another juvenile, but a female Edmontosaurus who was trying to run past him slammed against his head with her chest. The impact shoved the carnival back, but unfazed, he attacked again, this time biting down on the female's tail. His serrated teeth cut cleanly through the flesh and punctured even the bones beneath. He then wrenched backwards, trying to pull her away from the stampede. But as the female wailed in shock, she planted her arms onto the ground and kicked with her rear legs. Both feet slammed into the Rex's side, and with a great moan, he was forced to release her. Now free, she staggered back to rejoin the last of her herd members that were running by. Quickly recovering, the Tyrannosaurus moved after her, but saw too late that charging him from the side was one of the largest Edmontosaurus in the whole herd. Moving at top speed, the massive male bent down and then crashed into the carnival's side with tremendous force. The Tyrannosaurus let out a howl as it slid back on the wet earth and then came crashing down on his side, the impact creating a loud thud only drowned out by the dozens of stomping limbs. The Edmontosaurus that had collided with him briefly looked over the prone predator, but then moved on, forming in behind the last of the herd as they got out of the area. The fallen Rex was lucky he fell on such loose wet ground. Had it been solid like rock, such a fall could have seriously injured or killed him, though he still had multiple cracked ribs from the fall, and multiple pulled muscles from the Edmontosaurus impacting him. Eventually, he rolled onto his feet and stood up, but it was obvious from the brief exhale of pain and the slight limp he had that his left leg had been damaged, likely a fracture of some kind. And for a bipedal animal, any leg injury can seriously affect how they hunt. But Tyrannosaurus Rex lived tough lives, and something like this wouldn't stop him, especially not since he would soon have many mouths to feed. Further downriver, the Edmontosaurus herd slows and regroups. With adult Rexes, they usually don't have to run for long in order to outpace them. The young are still shaken, but the adults quickly go back to leisurely feeding, having seen this countless times before. If anything, the fact that none of them died meant there was no need to stop their usual routine, something that the young who survive into adulthood would come to learn. Hello fellow travelers, and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down one of the largest and most famous hadrosaur, Edmontosaurus. The first fossils of Edmontosaurus were discovered near the Canadian town of Edmonton, belonging to the Horseshoe Canyon Formation. It was named in 1917 as Edmontosaurus regalis. However, it was later found that other fossils discovered before this belonged to the Edmontosaurus genus. Many of these were dug up in 1891 in the Lance Formation in Wyoming, and originally named Calosaurus anectens. For over a century, many remains would be found in various formations, and as such, would be assigned to many different genuses, including Anatosaurus, Anatotitan, Hadrosaurus, Thespaceus, and Trachodon. To make a long story short, Many of the remains were later found to belong to Edmontosaurus, or other already named genuses, with some like Anatotitan becoming Nomandubiums. So as of today, there are two species of Edmontosaurus, Regalis and Anectens. So how do we tell the difference between the two? For starters, Regalis is only known from the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, and lived during the Campanian around 73 million years ago while Anectens is known from the Freshman, Hell Creek, and Lance formations, and lived during the Maastrichtian Age 66 million years ago. So they lived in similar locations, but almost 10 million years apart, 
and as we can see from this diagram, they do look different, as we have many individuals of both species, including about a dozen for Regalis, and much more for Ernectans, including those at different growth stages and even mummified individuals. Because of this, we have a wealth of knowledge on both species. In fact, it's one of the best researched genuses of dinosaur period. It was a hadrosaur in the Sorolophene subfamily that lived across western North America right up to the end of the Cretaceous period. It was one of the largest members of its family, potentially coming close to the largest under Shang Tungasaurus from China. Its exact size has gone back and forth throughout the years, with averages landing at adults being between 12 and 13 meters in length, standing 3 to 3.5 meters toward the hip while standing quadrupedally, and weighing between 6 and 7 tons with her gallus seen as being slightly larger. However, some fragmentary individuals indicate that they grew to 15 meters in length, and may have weighed up to 8 tons. These may have been outliers, however. The rare individuals that grew close to the maximum the species could obtain. Or these could be the result of sexual dimorphism, with one sex being larger than the other. Either way, the average Edmontosaurus was enormous, and a good example of how hadrosaurs weren't easy prey or harmless pushovers, which is how they are often portrayed as in the media. Overall, it is a typical hadrosaur build, with wide jaws and batteries of teeth, a strongly built torso, while having a long tail, powerful hind legs that are considerably larger than its forelimbs. As though they spent the majority of the time moving quadrupedally, they could run using just their hind legs. Let's break down its anatomy in more detail, starting with its skull. By itself, the skull was about a meter long, with large individuals having up to 1.2 meter long skulls. The back of the skull widens, but after the orbits, it narrows down before expanding again, creating the wide squarish beak, which when viewed from above, gives it a spoon-like shape. The beak itself was toothless, instead being made up of thick keratinous material. Both jaws had this material, but it was much larger on the upper jaw, getting to around 8 centimeters thick from top to bottom. Behind the beak were the teeth, and it had a lot of them. These mass assortments of tiny teeth are referred to as batteries. These batteries, or columns of teeth, were constantly regrown and replaced throughout the animal's life. They were small, layered, and compact, so much so that adults could have over a thousand teeth at any time. The inside of Edmontosaurus's mouth was essentially an industrial mulcher, as any plants would be grinded down by all these teeth as the animal chewed. To aid in this, Edmontosaurus had a thick lower jaw, with strong muscles, simply for the task of chewing. We can see a large nasal opening for the nostrils, and though not confirmed, this may have also been the site for slightly inflatable tissue, or colourful tissue used for display. Behind this is the orbits, which in one individual, sclerotic rings were preserved, so it's possible many other hadrosaurs also had these. Interestingly, a 3D scan of one nearly complete skull showed in Montesaurus may have had binocular vision. Odd for a herbivore, even one as large and powerful as Edmontosaurus. One of the mummies of Edmontosaurus regalis showed it had a small crest-like structure made out of soft tissue, which may have been used for display. Anectens could have had something similar, but there is almost 10 million years between these two species, so many external changes may have happened in that time period. Moving to the spine, the majority of the vertebra, including those of the tail, were reinforced with ossified tendons. This was described as making those parts of the back and tail ramrod straight, and obviously very inflexible. So why would it evolve this? Well, being so large, Edmontosaurus over its lifetime would have put its bones and joints under a lot of stress just from gravity, let alone moving on a regular basis. The ossified tendons would give the vertebra column extra strength and resistance, and though stiffening its body, the neck and shoulders still had good maneuverability. Plus it could still rear up on its hind legs, it just wasn't as much of an extreme angle as its smaller relatives. The forelimbs were shorter and much less robust than the hind limbs, with the upper arm and forelimb being almost the same length. It had four toes, though you wouldn't have seen them well, as they were covered by skin and muscle, with a single nail almost looking like a hoof. 
The rear leg was supported by a long, straight, thick thigh bone, and the whole leg was crammed with powerful muscles connecting to the hips and tail. It had three toes, having lost the big toe and little toe. These adaptations mean that Edmontosaurus may have run quadrupedally or bipedally, reaching speeds between 45 and 60 kilometers per hour. Because of its reduced forearms and stiff back, however, it may have been quite a poor swimmer, which is quite the find, seeing as hadrosaurs in general were originally seen as swamp-dwelling aquatic feeders. We know now that they were generalist herbivores, feeding on anything they could reach, which for the larger species was a very wide range of plants. Using their hard beak to snap or strip vegetation and grind it down with their batteries of teeth. Edmontosaurus was found to be able to chew, but it was in a forward and backwards motion, so not like how we chew. This also means that they have to have had well-developed cheeks in order to stop food from falling out of their mouths as they chewed. We have direct evidence of what Edmontosaurus ate thanks to some especially well-preserved remains, including from the previously mentioned mummies. Some of the gut contents include pine leaves and twigs, leaves of broadleaf trees, and various nuts. It should be noted it's possible some of these may be cases of the plants simply being preserved alongside the animal's body, however. With a decent size of Edmontosaurus remains, including incredibly complete ones, it should be no surprise that we have found a number of injuries. One had broken tail vertebra that may have been caused by a Tyrannosaurus rex bite. The Edmontosaurus survived this injury, long enough for there to be evidence of healing. Though a more recent study can't confirm it was a T-Rex bite, and may have been caused by some other factor. Another individual, around 7 meters long, had tooth marks from a small theropod on its lower jaw, and this wasn't from scavenging as some of the wounds show signs of healing. So it wasn't just large predators that went after these herbivores. Some of the strangest pathologies found on Edmontosaurus remains are actually tumors. A study done in 2003 that examined over 10,000 fossils, finding various tumors and cancers, but all of them were limited to Edmontosaurus and closely related hadrosaurs. There doesn't seem to be any specific reason why, with the report basically saying it likely may have been something broad like hadrosaurs having a genetic propensity for this, or some strange environmental factor. Edmontosaurus was one of the last surviving hadrosaurs, and is a great example of their adaptability, as well as clearly showing that these were large, powerful creatures that likely lived in huge numbers before the catastrophic end of the Cretaceous period. It's one of the best researched dinosaurs as well, thanks to a good sample size, not to mention three near-complete mummies that even show what the animal's skin looked like. They are so well preserved, it's actually quite easy to know what the animals look like in life, and that in itself is exceptionally rare. This has been a big episode for a big animal, and I couldn't quite cover everything. But I hope you all enjoyed learning about Edmontosaurus, and I appreciate all of those that made it this far. But what do you think of Edmontosaurus? And for my question of the week, how much of a threat do you think a single adult Edmontosaurus would be to a T-Rex? I am trying to help dispel the old way of thinking that hadrosaurs were dull, passive animals just waiting around to be killed with minimal effort on the predator's part. However, I do see a bit of the opposite with Edmontosaurus, with some saying it could snap a T-Rex in half like it was nothing. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts. What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? Until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.